Hey, everybody. I'm Louis Schwartzberg, and I'm going to be your host today. Many of you know me from the films I've made that celebrate life, making the invisible visible, because I love to take viewers on journeys through time and scale, focusing on the important planetary issues like the film I did, Fantastic Fungi. My work has always combined the how of science and the why of art. And that's always taken me into the sweet spot called wonder and awe, which I believe is the intersection between art and science. And that's what this podcast is all about. So welcome to our fifth episode. You know, what I learned from over my years of personal experience in filmmaking is that immersion in nature increases our capacity for courage, creativity, and kindness, which are the components we need in order to create a sustainable world. It's why I'm proud today to say that our podcast is supported by the Fetzer Institute. They're helping build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's new study, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us?, reveals how spirituality informs our understanding of ourselves and each other and inspires us to take action for the common good. You can explore these findings more at the spiritualitystudy.org. Also, I want to give a special thanks out to Ruth Westreich. The Westreich Foundation is incredible. Ruth is a wonderful artist and a leader in bringing art into the world of healthcare and education and a natural partner for our Wonder and Awe podcast. So today, I'm really glad to welcome Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin to the podcast. She's a North America director at 350.org, and she where she drives to work and build a multiracial, multi-generational climate movement that's capable of holding our leaders accountable to science and justice. She's an environmentalist focused on equity, access, and community, developing campaigns and programs to increase opportunities for vulnerable populations to access healthy air, clean energy, and toxic-free economy at the local, regional, and national levels. I also want to welcome William Padilla Brown, a self-taught urban farmer who founded the mushroom cultivation company Mycosymbiotics. His love of fungi expanded it to an annual festival in Pennsylvania, an educational YouTube channel, and his book, The Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook. He's also the founder of Community Compassion, an organization that empowers communities for a sustainable future and heightens quality of life with hyper-local food sources and skill sharing. I'd like to invite you to share your questions for our guests. And throughout this live broadcast, please remember, share your questions and comments, and also let our team know where you are writing from so we can feel this incredible global connection. William, in an interview for Fantastic Fungi, where I met you at the Telluride Mushroom Festival, which was great, you said, my parents never really took me on hikes or went outside. So finding mushrooms to me was like a spiritual journey. Can you describe the spiritual journey you took as you discovered nature and mushrooms? Yeah, that was a really interesting one. Um, it mostly started out of uh, having a desire to um, want to know what I was made of, you know, um, want to be connected with the food that I was eating. Um and I figured it all came from nature to begin with. So um, I figured it would be important to get outside. So I started to, um, as I experimented uh, with various plant medicines um, uh, and becoming an adult, um, I would oftentimes go out into the woods. Um, and I remember some of my first experiences being um, focused on on natural patterns. Um, and that's where I felt like a lot of the more spiritual aspects of it were coming from, uh, were from understanding those natural patterns. Um, they really, uh, um, connected me with something that I felt was like deep in, in my DNA, which, um, I now have a better understanding of, um, just a more natural type of linguistic, um, system, um, understanding symbolic language or over like auditory language, just something that's really rooted deep within us. Um, so I feel like that's where a lot of the spiritual uh, aspect of it came from. And I oftentimes say that, um, 
Um, mushrooms are like the hooked on phonics of nature. Um, because when you go out in the forest specifically looking for mushrooms, um, you have to learn about all the trees that they're associated with because certain mushrooms will only grow with certain trees. So even if you go out just looking for mushrooms, you're going to eventually learn a lot more about the forest than just the mushrooms. So, um, I think going out there just specifically looking for mushrooms really gave me a better, well-rounded understanding of the forest. Um, and then understanding and seeing those patterns really uh, mm -hmm. gave it that spiritual connection. That's really great, believe me. Um, I, I also, when I go out film, I see those patterns and they, I think those patterns are universal and they connect with the deepest part of my soul. It's so beautiful to see it like in, in, the, in, in the veins in the leaf, the veins in your body, in the cosmos. The fact that, you know, uh, the universe has a certain um, organic operating instruction and it'd be great if we could just sort of wake up and follow that. You know, and this idea of, of patterns and connection is one of the surprises I discovered in making Fantastic Fungi. You know, to discover that this mycelium network, this underground network, is a shared economy without greed where ecosystems can flourish. Tamara, I know you've been a longtime activist and leader in this climate movement and fighting to save our environment. So what lessons have you learned from nature? Wow, um, I'm not sure there are any lessons that I haven't learned from nature. Uh, <laughs> um, to, so that's a that's a big question. Uh, I've learned that you can't break anything that can't be fixed in nature. Um, that you cannot um, build a system that works better than what the blueprint will hold. Um, largely, that everything that we've built that solves problems in community comes from um, a form of biomimicry. So community is a multiplier of threats, of harm, and of everything that is good, right? So if you are able to get into great right relationship with the folks with you, you're more likely to survive. One example of that is that if you're in an extreme um, climate event, a fire, a flood, or even uh, some, some basic neighborhood uh, issue, you're more likely to survive if you're friends with your neighbor because they will help you. They will tell you something is happening. They will plan with you to get out of it. And that is a thing that comes from the communal and collective nature that we are, have inside of us. It's just another example of how that blueprint is playing out. So for me, the, the best solutions come from, from working together and that collectiveness is a form of nature. Yeah, again, another great lesson I learned, but I had no idea about that the mushrooms would teach me in making the movie is that nothing in nature lives alone. Yeah. And communities survive better than individuals. That is a truth. Um, yeah, nobody solves problems alone. I, I would say as an organizer, like the idea, there is no lone wolf. And anybody who tells you that they're doing it alone is probably selling you something. So so, so the flip side of that is that you can't do it by yourself for, for sure. Yeah. Nor would you? It's probably, you know, human beings, we're not the smartest, we're not the strongest, but maybe we're the most adaptable. And cooperation would seem to be our greatest asset in terms of uh, survival. And I think it's, uh, it seems really important now more than ever that we sort of honor the feminine side of nature, the idea of relationships, you know, nurturing, um, kindness, partnering, as opposed to the macho idea of survival, the fittest, kill or be killed, uh, the doggy dog story. We, we need a new story. Right. And, and the, the story of the feminine side of nature are, you know, they just happen to be the stories that, I, that turn me on and the ones I make, like about pollinators, about mycelium, um, about flowers, you know, engaging and giving us the fruits and nuts and seeds and all the good stuff we need to eat to make us healthy. That's what turns me on. Um, so, William, uh, I think you recently wrote that your son has grown up immersed in nature and you wrote that no matter where he goes in life or what he does, his mind is formed around natural patterns, not hard edges or social settings. These patterns will carry him throughout his life. Why do you think it's so important to immerse children in nature? Um, well, <clears throat> being a, a, a being that was evolved from this, this natural world, I think it's, um, um, really important um, for our mental health um, and for our understanding uh, of the way the world works to grow up um, in a natural setting. Um, all of those patterns that we see that help us um, 
um, build the way that we see the world. Um, I think our, it's incredibly important um, for, for the young mind to have that. So um, they have a better understanding when they go into the social settings or um, these man-made systems of, of what a healthy system actually looks like to begin with. Um, and I think those children that can not only understand what a healthy uh, forest system looks like, but what an unhealthy forest system looks like will be also at a, at even more of an advantage. Um, and then to take it further in the levels of, of uh, understanding remediation at a young age, because I feel like these are all, um, whenever I first learned permaculture, I had this like aha moment, like whenever I was like doing this permaculture, like uh, internship or um, um, apprenticeship or something like that here in Pennsylvania, I had this aha moment and I was like, this is, these are the things that everybody should know just growing up as a, as a human being on a, on this biological planet, um, that has these systems and that, that this is the way that the world works. Um, um, I think just growing up, knowing that, um, um, growing up, knowing how nature works will give a lot of people a better understanding or, or help people have better decision-making, um, when it comes to what they're purchasing, um, their, their waste streams, um, um, what they're eating and all these kinds of things um, will give people a better understanding of, of, of their impact in that natural mm -hmm. world as well. So there's just a lot of, of reasons. I mean, I could go on and on um, with positive reasons as to why um, it's important that young children have this exposure to nature. Um, but I really think that um, having our brain immersed in it will just help us get set right yeah. um, to, to approach life uh, with a more healthy understanding of ourselves and the world around us. I'd say it probably also helps with scale. <laughs> like we get, it's it's pretty difficult to be in nature and not figure out just how small you are in short order. And I think that that's healthy for um, any ecology, but specifically for the human mind, because you know coming to the end of yourself is really scary. And having and and thinking that you have to, it actually circles back to like the idea that you solve problems on your own. Nothing in nature does that because it's working in concert with other things, even as things are being born and dying. So, so like to introduce a child to that is giving them like a real heritage, some wealth yeah. up front. <laughs> because because you can spend your as someone, I'm a Brooklynite by birth and and by training, <laughs> and uh -huh. and if I and for every um, hardened edge street corner and um, Flatbush Avenue was like the great tundra of my life. Like, get, can I get across Flatbush Avenue before the lights go out to get towards the Hamburglar on Ocean Avenue, right? So if I'm getting, if I'm, and the difference between uh, that kind of day and a day where I was able to go to the clean side of Prospect Park was an entirely different experience in my day. Like I had access to Frederick Law Olmsted's other thing that he built in New York, not just Central Park, and being able to go there in the 80s before before it became what Brooklyn currently is, was a real difference in the way that the world worked, my experience of being with other people, and just like spending time by myself, not particularly engaged in something. Like those those two things, I think, have really helped me to have a sense of other worlds happening at the same time. And I think it is relational it makes you a better organizer it makes you a person who can see you know urban food systems and rural food systems and urban people and rural people as working in the same space despite the fact that there's so many political ways to separate folks so so i think you know sounds like you have a very fortunate son if, like if, if you know from day one they're able to experience the stuff that yeah. it's a lot of toxicity for most people to get to yeah well I'm also a Brooklynite, so there you go. I think my first whitewater experience was racing popsicle sticks down the gutter. <laughs> I love doing that, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> but, you know, we look. So we're we're trying to make a a sustainable world for our children. And like you say, whether it's urban or rural, right? We all want to create that bridge. We all have those shared values. But given the current situation we're in right now political pandemic, you know, we're all trying to connect with each other and reconnect with nature. And these are really powerful forces, I think, that are creating a lot of conflict. So tomorrow, let me ask you, I mean, give me your uh, perspective on what's happening and also what keeps you strong and what gives you resilience? 
Wow. Um, let's see. The seasons give me resilience, so I'm I'm a little low on it given how closely they're all coming together in this moment. Um, the political moment that we're in is really one of separatism and division and tribalism and um, a lot of stuff that makes us feel isolated and alone. Uh, the things that we are um, trying to determine for ourselves or what the future is going to look like for generations with a lot of question marks about whether or not we've been good stewards, if we are in right relationship, uh, who do we need to be in relationship with in order to survive what's coming um, from the perspective of folks who spend a lot of time talking about clean water, energy access, um, and the fossil fuels, it's pretty difficult to, um, to, to find the kind of harmony that you could when the industries, the systems, the products that we have built separate people. It separates us into folks who are addicted to using fossil fuels and to a specific kind of economy that's tied to everything, including the politics, and people who are saying, even if we don't know what's next, we can't keep doing that because it's destroying things we cannot replace. We cannot continue to have this extractive relationship. And a part of my work is bringing together those folks because in this moment, like the end game is not dying on a fiery gas ball, which means the ecology has to work, people on the planet have to be in a right relationship. And ultimately, if I am successful, if the other folks who care about this work are successful, if the communities that we operate in are successful, even the people who hate me will survive, right? So I think there's a real there's a real beauty in recognizing that we're literally in this together. And despite what 70, 70 uh, million people are thinking and 74 million other people um, are, are thinking, if those two ideas are in contravention, we still exist in the same place and have to come to some sort of conclusion about what the future is going to look like. And it can't be one based on suppression, subjugation, or a dominance from one group or the other. So it turns out um, that what's old is new. <laughs> and I think that's another thing that you learn in nature is that what's old is new. Everything gets recycled. Every Everything uh, in nature gets recycled into something else. And if we don't figure out how to compost the negative ideas we have about zero sum, we will not find that there's resources, that we're resource rich enough to carry the next few generations into where they have to go as the climate continues to change our relationship to each other, to our resources, and to just the ecology. So, I, So it feels a lot like we're in a moment of tension, but it's just our turn. The question is, are we going to show up and find that interconnectedness or are we going to suffer separately? So mm. the, the politics themselves are pretty, are pretty scary. People's concerns are rooted in whether they think they're going to survive and what they've chosen to try to get through it. But I think if we start to talk about what people are afraid of, things start to look a little more human. Cause I, cause even the people who, who who would prefer that I, that nothing I am fighting for, nothing my community needs is valuable to them. If we start to talk about why these things are important, we find a lot more commonalities than, than what the conclusions of those discussions might be otherwise. Yeah. Um, do you, do you feel there's a, is there any difference between social and environmental justice? Oh my God, no. So I love when people like it's I think that the human mind is can be very finite, can be very focused on things that helps us solve problems. But I think the idea that any of these pieces of work are separate is a fiction that we tell ourselves so that we don't feel overwhelmed by how much bigger it is than any one of us. So um in my work, I often tell people that that climate justice, environmental justice is a leaf on the tree on the branch of social justice work. All of it is our turn to deal with these same questions of like where resources go. Is the system working? If not, are we going to um, be brave enough to redesign? Like that's the question that's on the table that the country's been wrestling with for the last few weeks is the agreements that most of us were born into are not the agreements that are going to carry us into the future. Are we going to be brave enough to redesign? And are we going to be brave enough to recognize that the embers of what we're currently feeling and seeing and experiencing could be the fresh start to a whole bunch of other stuff if we're willing to be brave about what hasn't worked? And so rather than fighting amongst ourselves about the old blueprint, are we somebody going to take out a pencil and come up with something new using what we have, not what we wish we had? Beautiful. I agree. So, William, um, I know you spoke recently at the Symbiosis Symposium and a, um, an event dedicated to creating sustainable social and ecolog ecological change. What gives you hope for a sustainable future 
as we cope with these current challenges? Um, what gives me hope are the people on the ground that are doing the work. Um, as I've traveled over the past four or five years um, all around our country, um, everywhere I've gone, I've visited people and been able to stay with people and, and um, eat in their homes and, and, and check out their systems, um, whether it's an agricultural system or um, some technological system or some business they're running or just a beautiful homestead. Um, seeing people that are actively working towards the change um, to create the, the systems that are necessary for us to flourish in ways that we haven't seen. Um, um, that's what gives me hope. That's what, that's what I'm looking forward to, um, as we, as we, um, as we move forward, uh, here. Yeah. So you're, it's really beautiful because I, I feel like both of you are helping people around the world to take action in this transformational time. Do you guys see this as an opportunity for a reboot? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, I mean, it, it was only a matter of time. I've been thinking for since I was probably like 16 or 17 years old that this was all going to happen at some point. Um, I thought it was going to happen in like 10 years ago, eight years ago. Um, and then as, as more and more started happening with the uh, – ecosystems, our ecology, as more and more started happening in the political terrain and more as more and more started happening with human health in general on a broad scale. Um, I was like, all right, we're going to reach a tipping point here soon. That, like we're going to reach a point where um, there is no other choice. There is no other decision but to do the things that work because um, mm -hmm. they're so good at doing things exactly the opposite way, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, well, for me, really, it was like 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I mean, I was there for the Earth Day, you know, March and the movement for women, people of color. And um, yeah, we, we are at that point where I, it feels like Mother Nature put the brakes on. If you, I mean, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. Because any time in, in nature when a, a species kind of overrides the ability of the ecosystem to support it, it will step up and, and create balance, you know, yeah. that happens all the time. It, it's, it's just a biological, you know, fact of science. And we've been stressing the immune system seriously for a long time. And this, there, you know, there seems to be a, a cause and effect that, that that's happening right now. Um, yeah. I was, I, I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with, Judith LeBlanc from Native Organizers Alliance. Um, we did like a, a talk to a bunch of colleagues of ours about climate and indigeneity. And it was really an incredible conversation. One, because she set people straight that like indigeneity is not about a group, it's about your relationship to the land and everybody is indigenous to somewhere. So like take off all the formality around how you feel about that and just orient yourself to the place where you are because it'll probably make your life easier. But in talking about that, we talked about climate change as to checks and balances. Like it's proof that the things we built are a part of a much bigger system that we did not build. And and if, and if you're feeling uh, sick, if you're feeling exhausted, if you're feeling overexerted, it's because you've done all of those things to the environment around you. And so we're all getting checked. The question is, are we willing to get balanced or will we override the system and a redesign will come whether we want it or we don't? So I do think that like for folks who have been steward in the land everywhere they've been forever, this is not new information, but we feel very powerful as we build a thing inside a thing about what we built. So we um, build a political system. We build a system of capital. We think that that's the only market that exists and we're wrong. Like all of this is biomimicry. All of us, all of it is us trying to figure out how to reconnect to the bigger thing that makes things more dynamic and multiplies them. And so when our when the experiments that we've made become so sacrosanct that they force us to be extractive, we lose people. Yeah. Well, in, you know, Suck all the nutrients out of out of soil, we make it yeah. so that people cannot drink water when it's the only thing they actually need. So I think we have far overextended. And the fact that 
in our you know scientific discussions, it is our sense that we have until 2030 to get it right. There's some so much hubris in that. Like who like yeah. that is that is a set of conversations we're having based on indicators and our own feedback loop in a really small part of the bigger conversation. So I mean, I don't want to scare anybody because all of this is scary enough, but I, I do think it takes a certain amount of hubris to feel like, you know, our little piece of it while having such a dramatic impact can't be checked by all the other things that are dramatic and happening every day. Well, you know, so let me ask you tomorrow because it's interesting with 350.org, you know, you've been very, um, you know, science oriented, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, led by, you know, Bill McKibben. <laughs> and, um, and I've been as a filmmaker, you know, supporting a lot of the, you know, environmental, you know, PSAs and, and documentaries that I make. But I think I have to be honest and look back and say that uh, the messaging has not worked, you know, because if you put the science on the table, um, it doesn't seem to um, create the behavioral change we need. Um, what, I mean, the things I try to work on is I try to appeal to the heart because mm -hmm. it seems like the facts don't work. So I'm curious, as you're heading up, you know, 350.org, is there going to be a shift in strategy and messaging? Because I think the divide we talked about earlier, the people who voted for Biden or Trump, is all about the fact that we're living in the universe now where we only hear, you know, our own messaging. Mm -hmm. And 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 the messaging is the weapon. It's yeah. the battle, it's the battlefield. You know, it's a battlefield for consciousness, which goes back to spirituality in, in an interesting way. Because if I have your attention. I basically have your consciousness in the palm of my hand. So we can be vulgar, you know, and fearful, or we can try to engage you, which I think is really great that nature is beautiful. There is like a certain um, agenda there that, you know, I feel that with nature, it's a tool for survival because you protect what you love. You, lo you love it. And it, nobody taught you to love a forest. Nobody taught you to love, love a flower or the ocean, whatever element that really turns you on. So how do we shift behavior given we're living in a sci-fi uh, <laughs> brainwash bubble? Uh, it's all about, you know, how could I grab your eyeball? Octavia Butler wrote the manual on that. But, 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 but I think what I can, what I can tell you about the organization. So maybe the, our executive director was one of the founders with Bill and she is the executive director of the organization. Uh, the first 10 years were about just sounding an alarm, making sure people understood that this is happening. The science has proven it. It is not just a feeling. We've known since the 1800s that these forces were moving. We've known since the folks who caused these problems started to do their own hard homework on what their consequences were going to be and started covering that up with as much information as they possibly could, sowing disinformation, fossil fuel capitalists and the, and the corporate uh, enablers that support them in and outside the government have really made a real business, like the business of, of selling you stuff you don't need to cover up for their greed and their um, extractive behavior from from the second they drill into the oil to this uh, for oil to the second they deliver to someone else and all the things that have the chain of harm that happens in between. So the first ten years was just letting people know this is happening, uh, moving through the disinformation, making sure people understood that there are parts of this that we have, can have control over. Um, we can. Uh, interrupt and create an intervention. So the next 10 years has to be about solutions. It has to be about what's the big vision? What do we fight for that gives us more than what we currently have? We're locked into a system where there isn't a single part of your body, if you live in most places where you aren't not only uh, covered in, surrounded by inserting, eating, and using plastics, which is, you know, big oil's side hustle. Like you, we are so tied into that system of petro of petro domination that it would be very difficult for people to consciously separate themselves from it. So nature is stepping in to say you've overstepped. The next 10 years has to be about what are we going to build instead that's sustainable. And so for us, that that is looking at the money because it's so dominated the conversation that people cannot be confronted with real information because they're owned by people who told them not to take that in. So that means we have to become much more focused on what we're asking for. Uh, the Green New Deal, which is every, like, are you either love it or you love to hate it. Uh, I, I feel like it's a really great boogeyman because we've been paying for jobs, infrastructure, and human health 
ever since we built government. So if you call it the Green New Deal, you're not asking, we're still going to pay for roads. People are still going to get sick. And if we haven't given them space, we will be paying to bury them and as they get sick. And we have to pay, and we have to pay for the jobs that people do in between. So we can decide that those jobs are ones that feed a circular economy. We can decide that the infrastructure is one that isn't as extractive as what we've been doing and doesn't send people down a road to poor health and poor states of mind on the way to doing that. Like we can make choices all the way through those, those like those decision making processes. So as scary and as much of an interesting talking point as that is, the big vision for that is a global Green New Deal. One where we stop pretending that there are good guys and bad guys and start talking about impact and the change we want to see and how many more people we can bring into the conversation. Because even this locked political battle that we're in is really about whether people feel safe. People like Don, as a as a Brooklynite, I can tell you, you know, Donald Trump's from Queens, man. I got lots of beefs with him. Like even before he did all this foolishness that he's doing, you know, he's from another borough. I got a lot to say about what that means to me. So, uh-huh. so, the, so the fact that this dude from Queens is just gonna come, come, come to, um, to power and and really pretend to tap into the harm that people are feeling, it says much more about our failure to connect with people in community than whether or not he shows up as warm or caring or interesting. The only thing he ever did to make people follow him is acknowledge them. And that's our loss. That's our mistake. So I do think the next 10 years has to be about recognizing that there is no magic algorithm. We just have to start treating people like they're human, like what they need might be in the, in, in the space that we're in and offering them an opportunity because people go for hate not as a first or a primary driver, but as a, as a way to get through, to muddle through if they don't have love. So just, you know, just to put that out there, if we don't create a loving, expansive vision of what the future looks like, where there's some joy for everyone, people will be, are happy enough to be locked into drama because it feels a lot like love, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so we could either stay in this abusive relationship and die on a fiery gas ball, or we could get healthy to have a better relationship with each other and with nature and then see what we can build together after that. For me, the second thing sounds way more interesting. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people, um, especially in the United States, are so um, lost in in the comforts of that our country provides, um, in that in that um, dependent consumerism. Like people don't want to take that step out um, into a little bit of uncomfortability um, to to try and create something new, Um, because there are places where where people have set up a lot of systems or enough of these. Um, systems that are creating these more regenerative um, micro industries or uh, or working towards decentralized or 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 circular economic systems um, um, that it'd be easier for somebody that's still participating in these um, in these centralized uh, um, systems uh, of of dependence that we have now um, it'd be easier for somebody to step out of that but for most of the places um, in our country, and I can't speak for other countries because I've only ever visited. I've not spent enough time in these other countries to to speak on the, on that behalf. But um, um, there's, I mean, like where I'm at right now, there was no, there wasn't really any platform for for me to to, to step out um, with the cultural brainwashing that kind of Louis was talking about, that kind of uh, bubble uh, of of cultural programming. Um, there wasn't anything that led me to um, sustainable lifestyle choices or anything like that. That was something that the counterculture uh, uh, um, led me to without there really being a platform. Like I took my permaculture class and everything like that. And there wasn't really any economic structure or community um, generally around me that was there to be a platform for me to even start working and, and creating a lifestyle um, with those kind of uh, um, principles in mind. Yeah. Um, but William, but but aren't you doing that now? I mean, aren't you a practitioner of social permaculture? And maybe even explain for the audience what is permaculture, right? Mm-hmm. And how can that help an entire community? Right on. Um, well, permaculture is a design science. It's an ecological design science that uh, utilizes biomimicry or mimicking natural patterns to create sustainable systems. Um, um, systems that have and in, in, that are just inherently more sustainable than systems that are created without utilizing that biomimicry, um, because um, that biomimicry ensures that level of of um, 
tried and uh, uh, tested um, um, evolutionary uh, um, um, knowledge from, from, from natural systems. So um, we utilize that. And a lot of people think it's mostly focused around agriculture, um, which a lot of uh, permaculture designers do focus on agriculture. Um, but we can utilize natural systems to um, design better social systems as well. Um, and one of the first social type permaculture systems that I worked on was called uh, non-traditional independent education systems, um, which focused on, um, on kids um, that the school system might not have been for them. Like myself, I dropped out of high school and I know there's a lot of other kids like that. Um, so I created a system that could help an individual find um, um, what they want to learn about and, and ways to learn about that um, outside of, uh, of traditional academia, outside of uh, high school, college and all that kind of stuff. So um, now I've been focusing more on kind of grasping that attention um, as you're speaking of before um, through social media and, and all of that kind of stuff, which has been turning out to be fairly successful, um, kind of speaking in those in that that cultural language um, that that very currently changing um, cultural language um, and kind of grasping individuals' attention, uh, presenting them with something, but also slipping in that message of of the work that we're doing, um, and that that's been working out really well. And William, I know because like I filmed you like you know in in you know in in Baltimore where you were bringing like you know the idea of, of growing mushrooms not only maybe for food but to you know generate income. For people living in in the inner city, you know, on the vacant lot, uh, can you just share a little bit about like how what that effort is and and, and, and the feedback on that? Yeah, um, well, that the spot that you filmed me at in in uh, Baltimore um, is no longer there. Um, they they're no longer operational, which is unfortunate. Um, but I did teach in a lot of different cities um to kind of um i think i think that's where it's mostly needed um i've been doing all the different agricultural conferences and different events um out in the country for years and um it's not super accessible for people that live in the cities and i find it to be um semi-exclusive um in the sense that it's appealing mostly to people that are already interested in it that um, might, ne might not necessarily be the ones that benefit most from it. Um, and like, I'm not a huge proponent of like going into some city that I've never been into before saying, um, I know these techniques and I have the answers on how to make life better here because I don't know what life is even like there. I have some ideas based off of what I do know and what I've seen as I've moved around. Um, but I do think it's, it's really interesting to go into these areas um, being a young, diverse individual, um, and show these different tools, um, that I have for, uh, developing more sustainable systems that have provided me with income and have provided a lot of the people that I've taught, um, with income. Um, and not only that, that's like the, the, the first hook. Um, but the real goodness is, is, um, when people are able to just do it for the ecological regenerate, re regeneration or the social re revitalization or, or, uh, um, uh, um eco uh, mm -hmm. economic revitalization. Tomorrow. I'm curious, like with permaculture, do you got, do you relate to that as a model at all in a sense in, in the work that you do? So I came to this work through a couple of different angles. So my mom was a water protector for 39 years in an urban environment. And then, um, and, and moving like from her example, and my father was really deeply embedded in community as a part of his work. Um, it has been really important to think through um, the design elements of, of what we live in, how people experience it, um, whether or not we are in the same conversation around how resources are, are distributed throughout uh, cultural cues, community and design. And so in thinking, in thinking through the experiences that I have had, um, I came to this work from those roots into an urban environmentalist setting. Um, my first work was environmental law, uh, moved through to public health, uh, landed me in Baltimore doing really amazing work connecting communities that were harmed 
to folks in the medical community who could assign a series of con like context clues. So if communities are sick because they're being poisoned, uh, it's important to say that, but because the uh, doors to government are really closed if you don't have data or storytelling, which is the oldest form of data that we that we have as um, an, as audio communicators, um, if you don't have data and storytelling and a, and a, uh, in that story have a bad guy that the government is not in relationship with, it's difficult to do work. So, so, so really connecting with people who are working the land as it is, who are trying to solve for toxins that they did not put there, they were not told or going to be there in communities they were cited, pushed and shoved into by folks who didn't tell them that they would be out exposed to more poison uh, across their um, the course of their lives than, than they would ever be uh, able to um, understand, communicate, or even identify without the help of folks like William or like medical practitioners or folks in the um, in the uh, community or um, citizen science um, sectors of the work. So yeah, it does feel like conversations around design are vital for the future of communities because no matter where you are, you've been designed into that place unless you wake up on the forest floor, right? So, mm -hmm. so for most people, um, waking up in the life that you have feels like a set of choices people have made, but it's really about a set of choices that the whole society has made for you and whether or not you can identify food in your own community, uh, make relationships with other people, come in contact with other folks. Those are all decisions that have been made about how you live, what those materials are made like, made of, and how close you are to other people. So I do think that there are tons of lessons to be learned about how our humanity fits into the larger conversation. And it all starts with revisiting design, whether you are in an urban context or a rural context. In Baltimore, where I live, we experience a lot of both. Uh, I, live in, I live in a zip code um, that's next to the one where, um, where, where people live 30 years longer than anywhere else in the same city. Like that's not about anything other than design. Like you can't, people's, the quality of people's lives, the amount of whether or not they achieve health, that's a set of decisions made by people who uh, make planning and city decisions, transportation and zoning decisions, uh, who decide whether or not you have access to energy or you have the ability to grow it yourself. A really right. good colleague of mine, Crystal Hansley, uh, opened up uh, We Solar, which is a Baltimore solar farm for community solar. Like it should, it, it, we should, we've had this technology since the 70s. It's insane. That even that that were that were 30, 40 years to, into communities who were designed into places where they don't have agency about how they operate to be able to have access to create power from the sun and not be owing somebody every day just to turn their lights on and decide between that and whether they're gonna pay for food. So I just so I do think that like the kind of knowledge that William is talking about is holding and brings into community is really deeply powerful because people are trained not to see this. They're trained not to know these things. And if and if that knowledge and information is kept in clo cloistered spaces with people who are able to dispense it and not, you know, unleashed into the the larger ecosystem, people just walk around and whatever's handed to them. And then they're blamed for the outcomes. Yeah. Again, I think you've woven the fabric that the social justice and environmental justice are really one and the same, right? Yeah. You really can't have one without the other. I mean, whatever values you have regarding the environment and, and social justice, uh, it's an oxymoron to say I'm an environmentalist, but, I, but I'm a racist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it can't I, I happen. I have this conversation more often than I would like to. But I, but I can tell you, driving through the state of Maryland when I first came here in 2015, one of the things I did was go to every single county. I used to have a job where I had to go to every single. So I went all the way deep in the Howard County and Garrett County on the other end of Maryland. And and I would watch people. I watched the wheels turn in their mind. And they're like, do I want to be, I want to be helped, but do I want to be helped by you? So I would, I would show up and I felt like a ghostbuster. They're like, my community is being poisoned. And my friends, I, I believe you. Tell me what you're experiencing. And then I, and I would watch, like, if I'm talking to two people, one of them would go, she said she believes me. Let me take her to this lake. Let me show her this thing that's happening to my community. And the other person's like, but I was told by someone I'm not supposed to trust you. And I watched them legitimately taking, like going through the steps of like, she believes me. I don't know. 
and, and, and ultimately end up working with the person who's like, yeah, okay. She says she believes me. That's more than I got yesterday. And we, you know, so then we, so then we work on trying to figure out what medical people can help us to prove that the harm you're experiencing isn't your genetics. Like, isn't the, isn't some stuff that's been visited on you by choices you made and how do we connect you with, um, a politician who's not so bought out by people who pay you to be silent that they're willing to help confront the government that takes your money to, right. to help you get fixed. Okay. What do you, uh, I mean, that's, that's just incredible. Um, because I think really the path forward is, you know, building bridges and it seems like the work you were doing, you know, being able to say, do you want to be healthy? Do you want to have a good future for your children? Um, those are all things I think we share in common and certainly would be a good starting point to have the conversation because it is so easy to just say, you know, or to, to create blame and guilt and go, look, here are the facts, you know, here's the data, you know, uh, the air is getting polluted. The lake is, is polluted. Where you go fishing is polluted. It, it's easier to say, hey, if you want to go fishing with your kids when they grow up, here's a, here's a reason why we want to, you know, maintain yeah. this environment. You know, yeah. well, you can maintain your lifestyle. You can you can honor their culture and their way of life. I think that's a way to have the conversation, right? Yeah, I'm feeling the people's humanity and the, and yeah. the, and the community they came from. It works every time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what what changes do we hope to see as we go through this transformational moment? Um. We hope to see less suffering. Uh, we hope to see more people um, that have food in their belly at the end of the day. Um, better education for individuals. Um, more, more focus on education. More, more funding towards education um, because I'm, I think it's just absurd um, that we're still teaching in the ways that we do when we have such an understanding that that everybody learns differently, and we we need to be better equipped um, to, to educate a country that's going to take us to different levels uh, of, of understanding and different levels of, of, uh, um, of, of humanity, really. Um, um, so I think putting better, more, fo more focus into education, you know, um, better food options, more food justice, you know, um, out here, I mean, I've worked with so many different farms. I've worked on so many different farms, seeing people producing so much quality food. Um, this fall, on multiple occasions, I found mush a single mushroom um, that could feed multiple families. Um, so when there's food out there like that, I just think it's absurd that anybody's uh, still going hungry. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I just think more, more good food on people's plates, uh, more education. Um, you know, people got to know what to do with the food that they're getting um, when they're getting real good food. It's almost alien compared to the food that we've been served um, as, as we grow, grew up here. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, more more connection and more reverence uh, for nature, because, you know, as more people care about it, more people will um, act to protect it. So that's what I see. And then, you know, I think with those kinds of things in place, I think that the potentials are are limitless for, for what humans will start to create for themselves whenever their desires are shifted. Um, Tomorrow, your big uh, hopes? Um, that the present that is currently female will be a future <laughs> where we don't care so much about gender. Um, I'm, I'd, be, I'd be super pumped to see us uh, pr practice more collective market-based solutions that are not about um, outside markets, but about the market we're already in, about moving resources to where they need to go. Um, I'm excited for us to stop doing things that hurt us and funding it. Uh, I'm excited for us to start making investments in what the future is going to look like. So stopping the harm and starting uh, more care and repair. Uh, the biggest part of my work at 350 for the last uh, year and eight months has been focused on the idea that we need to demand climate reparations because there are greedy, filthy companies that make their money killing us. And you know what we need to do? Seize their assets and give that back to people who have plenty of ideas about what it would be like to survive if they didn't have to worry about uh, being polluted and having their lives cut short and whether they're going to achieve health. There are real damages that have been caused to people who have um, been left to fend for themselves in the big community. 
And I think it's time for us to start with care and repair. Uh, in this moment, this political moment that we're in, that's a good place to go because we've all experienced so much trauma in the course of just getting to the moment where we could have an election. People have experienced group trauma from people fighting over resources in the public. I think we need to start with care and repair. We need to ask people what that means. We need to focus on uh, removing some of the harm, agreeing not to do that anymore, and ask people what, what it is they would require for us to move forward. So I'm looking for more collaboration. I'm looking for regeneration and for care and repair in every way that we can get it. Amen. <laughs> um, so for either of you, let me ask you a question. Like what moments in your life made you feel wonder and awe? And can it be a tool for galvanizing a movement? You want to go on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start and say that. Um, in my life, I've been very fortunate to move every three years for somewhere like 21 years doing environmental work. So I experienced um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and DC, and London, and New York, and the US Virgin Islands. And the thing that I know for sure is that there are beautiful people everywhere making things out of, out of making life out of things you that you cannot identify. Um, really falling in love with how people relate to the land that they are in. Uh, paying attention to the ways that they have made and not projecting your own view of what success looks like under those folks is the only thing that ties up all of the things that we have built out of what we have. So I can go to Montana and see uh, what big sky really means. I could go to uh, Yellowstone and, and watch, an, watch an animal I cannot identify, eat another animal that I cannot identify. And there's so much, there's so much beauty in just all of that all of what's being transacted there and then go back home to the city I live in or the city that I'm from and see incredible beauty of an entirely different kind. So I think if we spent more time knitting together what we're, what we are inspired by rather than what we are afraid of, we get a lot further. Yep. Yeah, it's easy to fall for fear. It takes a little bit of effort to uh, embrace, you know, beauty and love. Yeah. Uh, because we're hardwired, you know, from the primal part of our brain just to react to fear. But that was really beautiful. William? Geez, can you repeat the question? I got lost. Yeah. No, I mean, what moment in your life made you feel wonder and awe? And yeah. can it be a tool for galvanizing, you know, a movement or, or the work that you do? What moment in my life? Um, Moments, plural. Jeez, I mean, I think that I think the moment my kid was born was probably one of the most um, empowering and like just multi-dimensional, like myriad of emotions uh, um, type of of experience that inspired me with wonder and awe and like um, really changed everything for me. And <clears throat> as far as like that being something. Um, that could be galvanized for a movement, you know, um, I don't think that that's the route that everybody's going to take. I don't think that everybody's going to have kids, you know, I don't think everybody needs to have kids. Um, but that for me was something that really um, galvanized everything I do. Because I mean, as soon as my, as, as soon as my son was born, I knew that I had to get, um, kick it into high gear, you know, I knew that I had to uh, be able to provide for him and, um, um help to create um, a, a world that that I could just feel comfortable about him living in, you know? Um, so for me, that that was one of the most powerful ones. And then, you know, um, well, that, that's pretty big, I, it's pretty big I, for me as well. I can know? support that and say that um, in 2019, I was my first assignment at 350 was being involved in the US climate strikes. So my job was to make that work multiracial and multi-generational. We got 7.6 million people to get out in the streets across the world across, at the same time. What was exciting about that is the kids. There are children who ran that, who ran those protests. The folk, they said, look at me. I have the right to have a future and decide what that's going to mean. 
and in so many languages across so many places. There were 185 countries of people who responded to those kids saying, yeah, you do deserve the right to determine what your future looks like. There's only two countries where there wasn't a protest, but you know, I feel like those folks gotta be slightly embarrassed. But, <laughs> for, but for everybody else that got out there, the kids didn't have big, deep, complicated demands. They just said, we want a chance. Give us the opportunity to live. Stop making decisions that foreclose the options in front of me. And I think it was really beautiful and inspiring to watch them put their bodies on the line, ask yeah. other people to help them and be vulnerable, um, uh, make it cool to care about climate. I, I met a kid. I met a kid um, uh, in the middle of in the middle of a park not far from where I grew up, and he was like, "Who's Greta?" And the reason he said this was because he was like, "I said, what do you mean, who's Greta?" He's like, "Everyone had all these signs about somebody named Greta, the horror movie." And I was like, "No, Greta Thunberg, she's a climate activist." And they and he said, "Oh," and I, so I said, "Why did you come?" He's like, "My friend said this is where everybody was going to be." And I was like, "So wait a minute, you came because this is cool? We've won!" Like, like it was it was a really great moment to feel like, "Wow, this this guy stumbled into a moment because his friends said that you got to get out here and save the planet." And I yeah. thought. You could, if or I was when I was your age, I would have been at the mall, caught up yeah. in the foolishness. Uh-huh. You out here trying to save the planet because it's cool to do that, and mm-hmm. I think that is inspiring. Like that kind of energy, uh, the decision that they all made that they could sit in a school building learning about things that they won't be able to achieve if they don't get their butts out in the street. And I and over and over again, every time I felt sad or tired or disillusioned. There's been another one of them who just said, give me a chance. Can you, or will you help me to get a chance? And right. it's just been really inspiring over and over again. Um, no matter where I've seen it and no matter how many times I see it, they give me hope. And they're not, a, they're not afraid to call BS on everything that just isn't for them. There are so many tropes that we've bought into because of design around who has the right to stuff. And they're just like, that's garbage. Like, like they're, they're very quick to, t- to, to call some trash, some trash and move on. So I, I am constantly inspired by the folks who, who were just born and are figuring it out faster than that, than the rest of us. It was, was, that was the March, the year before the Paris Accords, correct? Yeah. So 20, 2019's climate yeah. strike was just a, just an, it was a feast for your eyes. And I think That's even right. this last mm-hmm. week, of people protesting for the right to 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 live in a country where climate is a conversation we can have. Uh, right. There are two kinds of images. There are people who are really sad and angry about losing stuff, mm-hmm. and there are people out in the streets fighting for life. Mm-hmm. And like, if you look at the faces of the people fighting for life and the colors that they drape themselves in and the dancing they were doing in the streets, like they were pushing like the whole energy of the universe towards like a beauty and joy and life. And right. I feel like you can't really argue like there would be the, the, the same way that that young man was pulled into the crowd because his friend said that that's where you should go. It's irresistible. If you make your movement irresistible, people will do it. Yeah. And, and life's pretty irresistible. Well, I, I was there because we did a short film that opened up the UN, uh, you know, the United Nations General Assembly that convened on climate change. And we made a short film to get these world leaders to wake up. It was right before President Obama spoke and Leo DiCaprio spoke. And um, in order to get their attention, you know, we needed the voice of God. So we got Morgan Freeman to do the narration. <laughs> and, um, you know, Hans Zimmer did the music. And um, But I remember, you know, going to Central Park at the head of the march. And I wasn't you know, even intending to film that day, but I had my camera with me. And I stood at the head of the march and I let that march flow through me. Mm-hmm. I just held my ground and the whole thing went through me. And I saw young and old and like you're describing all these young kids, college kids, mm-hmm. you know, banners for like, you know, people that are, you know, Catholic and Jewish and Christian and Hindu. And it was so beautiful to see this multi-generational, you know, multi-racial um, expression of who we are. So uh, I just wanted to thank you because I know that you're a key in making that work and it was a giant success. Yeah. I mean, the aerial shots of it, looking down, you know, it was like, you know, block after block after block after block of just people. And now we take that for granted. I mean, shit, we can't do that anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, we can't even be in the proximity with each other. It is these times will make us the creative in different ways. 
and like nature, we will find ways to adapt. I mean, I, I've been to some pretty awesome digital rallies that'll make you forget you're in your living room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the kids are doing that too. I'm like, wait a minute, I could sit in this box and feel like I'm with people. You know, like they, they figured out, you know, they could do 24 hours of, of people talking about why they care about the planet, what they love, cl- like what they're fighting for. And they earnest like r- demands to be treated like human beings or what's smashing all of it. And there's four generations of activists in this fight. There's people who like started in the in the sixties, they were in the they were the yippies who just wanted who just wanted to solve some specific problems and ended up with the job going, Yeah, go ahead, kid. That's what I was talking about. Let me see what I can do to help you out. And so there's real beauty in watching folks who've been at it for a while, like that energy and wisdom exchange. Yeah. Of, of folks who are like, I can tell you how this could end if you give up your principles. And and they whisper that into the ear of someone who's full of guts and glory. And between the two of them, we skip a lot of mistakes. So I think we need, like, I I have been blessed to see, I call them seasoned activists. Like uh, someone's grandma who will rip off their shirt and get arrested in a heartbeat. They're like, I already lived. It's time for these kids to live. You know, like they're the people who knock down your door and demand to be to uh, demand to get in front of the protest to protect the other people that are there. And I think that that is also happening at this moment. So the key words are you hit them on the nail on the head is, is that if it's not multiracial and it's not multigenerational, we're missing out because it gets better from here. Yeah. And that is the the lesson of of nature, this idea of a giant interconnection, again, not based on greed, for ecosystems to flourish, for everyone to benefit. Nature's operating instructions also happens to be a beautiful model for social and political change. It's right there, literally under our feet, right? Well, this has been a great conversation. I think we're close to, you know, the hour. And what I'd like to do is um, thank both you guys. This has been so inspiring. Um, I think it's a healthy conversation that people will um, connect with because the idea that these issues, permaculture, social justice, environmental, you know, consciousness, you know, climate change are all interconnected. And what you do for one enables the other. And it has to be a holistic approach. And this is a great time for a reboot, an amazing time, because going back to normal was not what we want. Too many people starving, too many people suffering. What a great opportunity to hit pause and envision and reimagine a brighter future. And so thank you guys both for being the changers. I love you guys for that. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And thank you. So, and also want to, again, thank our, our sponsors that help, you know, cover the cost of all the great people that make this happen. Um, the Weistrich Foundation. I'm proud that, you know, for their support for change makers around the world, it gives us a voice for those that are not heard to be heard. And also um, the, you know, Fetzer, explore this new study, what does spiritually mean to us? When I say us, it means the United States. They did incredible research and data asking people who are conservative and liberal and everything in between, what spirituality means to them. And surprisingly, they discovered that it indirectly meant political because it meant you know, being a part of a community, being part of, of a church. And that translates into political activity as well. So it was, I think, a shock for a lot of people when asked a question about spirituality that they ended up in a place that was a conversation about community and politics. Um, Also wanted to thank the incredible team that helps us put this podcast together. Um, The folks from Moving Art, Leland, Andy, Courtney, Sarah, and from Magical Threads, Bethany, Ron, Jason, and Bob, and and Sean. Um, This has been really fantastic. Um, Stay tuned for more enlightening conversations. You can find it on, you know, YouTube and Facebook and Spotify and iTunes, all the cool places that you want to hang out. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.